Welcome to our very first ever Coffee Conversations with the lovely Sally of artisan ice cream brand Simply Ice Cream. Sally started the company in 2005 and has grown into a team of eight based at her home factory just outside Ashford in Kent. Now having to compete with what about 1500 artisan ice cream producers when she started is a feat in and of itself, not mentioning Ben and & Jerry's and the Hagen dazs but Sally's taken on the challenge head on and here they are 15 years later in over 450 outlets across the Southeast, making upwards of 5,000 liters of ice cream every week, and without ever swaying from the things that were most important to her to begin with, which is making every liter by hand, and never moving from her home base factory. So welcome, Sally. Hello. Hi. Following on from those, uh, those things that are most important to you and were most important to you when you started, what was your mission when you first started up, and, and has that changed over the years? I think when we first started, it was very much, um, my background is catering. It's, um, I've always worked within the hospitality catering sector. And um, I mean, the, the sort of, um, the ethos behind the ice cream is that we wanted to make a natural ice cream. Um, the sort of driving force behind it was that I was doing up to 80 weddings a year at the time of my catering business. And what I was finding was I had four children um, who were all quite young at the time. And I saw them during the week when I was prepping for functions and my husband's had them on the weekend. So we didn't actually see each other as a family unit. So I think, you know, the driving force at the time was to set up a business that we could supply a product into retail and have our weekends back, which was really naive because <laughs> obviously, you know, so when, you, when you're when you building a business and, and especially with product base, you, you have to go out and sample, you go to events, you, you know, you're marketing the whole time. And predominantly, those marketing events were weekends. So we actually ended up um, working twice as hard, actually. And, and I still, you know, the catering company was still continuing, although I did sort of start to sort of ramp it down a little um, so that, you know, I, we were able to do these ice cream events on the weekend in place of weddings. Um, but even, you know, sort of up to a couple of years ago, um, predominantly we were still doing sampling events and things to promote the ice cream um, on a regular basis on the weekends. So is that still, has that, was that, I guess, to start kind of your main marketing um, ammunition, I guess you would say, is to do kind of live events or um, what other marketing have you done over the years and has it changed since you started? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, sort of, I actually, sort of having worked in the hospitality sector, I had a lot of knowledge about, you know, what works and what doesn't within food preparation, um, but I didn't actually have marketing, accounting, um, you know, any sort of business acumen at all, you know, so although I run these businesses, and I've always worked for myself, I've never really been employed, um, but I've, you know, sort of run businesses that didn't need as much sort of put into them as, as this has um, and so it has been a very steep learning curve and over the years I've made lots and lots of mistakes um, I mean at one stage I was spending so much on advertising and marketing that you know sort of when we looked at it it was sort of almost more than the wages um, and you know although there is a sort of rule of thumb that you you set aside 10% of your turnover for marketing at least um, I was finding that you know initially I, I did an awful lot of advertising in magazines course pages and things which Actually, in retrospect, I don't know how many people actually noticed adverts in magazines. You know, I think going forward, when we were able to sort of look at PR and things, I think editorial was was much more beneficial to the company. Mm. Um, but I think, yes, yeah, certainly when we first started, um, we we actually went round to lots of independents with samples, and and actually that is still our main sort of marketing strategy is to actually get people to taste it because we make it very differently. It's, it's not a machine-made product, we make it by hand. There is 50% double cream in it, so it's very different in taste and texture to, to your average ice cream. And I think, you know, ice cream is a word that we all know. Um, we've all tasted ice cream. And so I think, you know, sort of within our psyche, we all think we know what ice cream tastes like. So actually when you taste it, the ice cream it is a very different taste. It is. Um, <laughs> and, 
If anyone out there hasn't tried Simply Ice Cream, you need to find it and try it because it's not like ice cream. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's a, an indulgent dessert, I think. Yeah. And I think, you know, when we first started sort of going around to the farm shops, um, within Kent, there was only really one other company that was making ice cream at the time that had any sort of presence within the Kent County and, you know, as a local produce. So um, I think, you know, when we went into these stores, you know, we were very careful not to say we want to replace this, this line. Um, we, we actually sort of touted it as, as something you could sell alongside your, uh, you know, your existing lines because it's quite different. Mm. Um, and although it's ice cream, um, you know, we, we sort of, we placed it in, in a position of, you know, giving your consumers choice really. So um, I think that was, that was our main marketing ploy at the time was to go in and get people to taste it. And so we, we would go into the farm shops, you know, offer the, the owners some samples and then offer to come in and sample their consumers so that actually, you know, there was pickup straight away. Um, and then, you know, touch with, you know, there's a loyal fan still. We, we still have a lot of people um, that, you know, we supplied 12, 15 years ago that still buy our ice cream. Yeah. Um, because we've got fresh cream. Um, my next question actually has to do with what you just mentioned about the quality and the taste. Um, if you are a new food business or, or talking to somebody who's thinking about going into selling some kind of artisan food product, do you think in your experience that your sales are almost always directly related to the person tasting that product or is there more to it, to sales, than just the quality or taste? Um, I, think, I think these days... You know, so the consumer is much more aware than they used to be of sort of provenance and ingredients and and ethos within a company. Um, so I think all those things are important as well. I think you know we as as a company, I think you need to be seen to be proactive, sort of environmentally, sustainably. Um, I think more and more that's becoming more important. So your packaging needs to be looked at, um, and you just need to be um, working in an ethical manner. And I think that's just as important as the consumer as the actual product. I think packaging is really important. You need to get that right. Um, you know, sort of, I think people buy with their eyes. So, you know, if, if, if you have a product that stands out on the shelf, people will go for that product. You then obviously have to get the quality um, for them to, to go back and buy it again. Um, you know, something can look amazing and taste dreadful. So mm. I think, you know, there are lots of sort of elements that you have to consider when you're setting up. Yeah. So now down to the kind of boring stuff, but really important, obviously, when starting a business. Tell us how you funded your business to begin with. Have you uh, borrowed over the years? Have you had investors or um, did you grow organically? Kind of give us a little insight into that. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we've absolutely grown organically over the years. We, um, as I said, when we first set up, we literally set up, um, I was already running a catering business so we already had approval from the environmental health officers when we first set up we operated from our kitchen um the only proviso was that we couldn't make ice cream when we were doing catering which i mean physically it would have been impossible anyway but so the idea was that um we would put the children to bed at night and then between nine and one um having cleaned the kitchen down completely we would make ice cream i know um so my husband and i initially started um he was mainly my pot washer while I did all this sort of preparation and making and um, and that's how we did it for the first 18 months. And we did it really slowly. We, we started off with one farm shop locally and we supplied them for six months. And that was really to test the market because although um, we had done a couple of sort of consumer events where it seemed to go down quite well. And obviously I've been making the ice cream for years for the catering. Um, and we had lots and lots. I mean, the reason I went into it was lots and lots of, sort of wedding guests would come in and ask where they could buy the ice cream. And so that's where the idea came from, that maybe we had a product that we could sell into retail and have our weekends back. Um, so, you know, sort of, I think initially you sort of think, you know, you've had all this good feedback. And I think, you know, when you when you cook and, and something is, is nice, your friends and your family are always going to tell you, this is amazing, you should sell it, you, know, you should start, start selling into retail. But actually... The general consumer is not going to be as kind as your friends and your family. So I think it's really important that you go out there and you test the market as, 
as well as you can. And I think for us, we decided that if we tested the market in a local farm shop, we were selling to complete strangers. There was no face to face. Um, the feedback we were getting from the farm shop was brilliant. So the following, um, so we actually we actually launched it in October um, in this particular in the winter shop, which, ice cream. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> ice cream October through to March <laughs> is a trial I don't think but anyway um it seemed to work so the following spring I then went into um five more that year but it was a very slow organic growth and actually that enabled me not to need investment right. um I obviously with the catering you have weddings booked you know two years in advance so I knew that I was sort of fairly stacked up with work for those two years and if I was to sort of ramp the ice cream up I would need to reduce the catering so I had that time um to be able to do that and it you know sort of I suppose you know sort of it did mean that we we did grow very slowly and very organically and you know sort of in retrospect we could have ramped it up a lot quicker than we did but really it wasn't until 2008 when Waitrose approached us that I thought well actually I think we have a business here mm. um so I'm going to give it more time um, so you kind of started we it as a to... as a side hustle really side hustle to your catering your main business yeah I mean it, well it was it was an idea to sort of as I say get get our weekends back um the reality never happened um but also I think you know sort of what I didn't want to do was risk you know the family house and and the family um sort of investing lots of time and money and energy in something that may or may not work so I think you know it was it was quite beneficial to do it that slowly um and I think because I also had this catering company which was that was my income I was able to do it without jeopardizing um anything else really yeah so once upon a time you told me a story about a certain retail giant that approached you and asked if you could provide ice cream for their shops um only if you were to move into a commercial factory. Is that right? Did that actually happen? <laughs> or am I, yes. And, and yep. let us, let, um, let, let me know about exactly kind of what happened and, and why you chose what you did in the end. Okay, well, um, I mean, a friend actually had rung me up and said, there, um, there's a Meet the Buyers event. Um, I want you to come. And so she picked me up, took me up there. And as we got there, um, we drove in, and this particular retailer um, had sponsored the whole event, and so it, their branding was everywhere. And I was like, mm, I don't actually really want to be here because it's not a retailer that I've ever thought to go into. Um, anyway, she convinced me that it'd be good to just see what the buyers thought because it, you know, that would give us an overview. Um, anyway, having sort of sat through this meet the buyers, um, they decided they would like to list it straight away. Um, which I was sort of not keen to do because I think, again, you know, sort of, although I didn't have an awful lot of knowledge of, you know, sort of brand positioning and things, I knew that for me, um, we needed to go to Waitrose first um, because it's a premium brand. We wanted to sit in the premium section and therefore Waitrose to me was the obvious choice. Um, if we had gone into more of the mainstream retailers straight away, we wouldn't have got into Waitrose. Um, right. So... I came away from there saying, you know, sort of, I'm not really interested, thank you very much. Um, but they then um, pursued us, really, for um, the next three months. Um, they, the local buyers turned up on the doorstep a couple of times. Um, we did have conversations about the fact that, you know, we had a domestic setting. Very early on, we actually applied for sales accreditation, which is the smaller local supplier accreditation, a little bit like BRC, but for smaller suppliers. Um, we were one of the first to, to list with them and um, you know so they were very happy with the domestic setting we had a, at the time we'd moved out of the kitchen into a dedicated sort of factory space but um, we had um, we'd basically taken a third of our house um, and made that into a factory space and we're still operating from that today um, so you know, I was really happy with what we'd done. We'd worked with Salsa to make sure that it was compliant and everything else. And um, they were happy for us to stay there until the following March, but then to move to a bigger factory. But they wanted us to spend about £40,000 um, at the time to um, you know, put in machinery that they wanted installed. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then it would have cost about 100,000 to move sites. So it was a no brainer to me. It was just, it wasn't going to happen. Um, that year we'd actually entered the Quality Food Awards. And um, when I turned up, they were the sponsor on our table. Um, <laughs> oh, the same people. Three. We got an automatic listing. And I was oh, really <laughs> So, um, I mean, they, they were, you know, lovely guys, lovely buyers. Um, but it just wasn't somewhere I wanted to position ourselves at that time. Do you um, regret it now? And I, no, yeah. no, I don't actually. I think, you know, we have found over the years that, um, you know, Waitrose have been fantastic to work with and it is great brand positioning. Everyone knows Waitrose and, and you know, sort of have always considered them just that little bit extra, little bit special. Mm. So um, it's certainly... I think, I think as a food brand, you have to make a decision as to whether you're going to go mainstream and and multiples. And it's very difficult because, you know, actually, very few of the population shop in farm shops and delis and independents. Um, you know, it's convenience these days mm -hmm. to go to the retailers. And, um, you know, I mean, even Waitrose doesn't have a massive share of that consumer spend. Um, but... If you're going to go into the other retailers, um, then you have to be prepared to accept that the independents won't have you um, because they like the point of difference that you're not in all the major retailers. Mm. Um, and you're also going to have to look at your margin. Um, and so, and your promotions are more um, prominent um, in, in, the, in the major retailers. So yeah. I think it's, it's a decision that you have to make um, for yourself quite early on. And if, if you have a product that can be mass produced um, with with enough margin in the product to be on promotion every other week, then, you know, that is your route to market. But I think if you're premium, you really want to sort of concentrate on farm shops and delis and independents um, where, you know, I, I mean, I've found that customer loyalty and retailer loyalty actually within that sector um, for a premium product is, is, is there, which, you know, I think you've got to remember that within the multiple retailers, there are so many lines on the shelves that you may get lost. Right, yeah. Yeah, definitely, I can uh, see that. I think that's really good advice for up and coming food businesses. Um, so have you, I'm sure you have, but how important have outsourced um, professional services been in your business over the years? So things like solicitors and accountants and marketing agencies and all those people that you don't have in-house um how yeah. have they played a role in the growth of your company um massive role actually they um i've always been a firm believer that you know sort of i think running your own business is a very lonely thing to do um and and i also think that the majority of us sit here 90 percent of the time thinking we're complete frauds and you know what are we really doing you know are we doing it right are we doing it well enough and i think you know to have to have people you can bounce ideas off to to have people you can sort of confide in and um and share issues with is really important and so for me you know sort of i think um to have you know pr agents marketing people accountants consultants um i think it's really important that that you do actually set some cash aside to work with people like that who they're specialists in their field you, you can't be all things to all sectors mm. um and so you know and i i completely hold my hands up finance is something that is never it's i've always hated it um so i think you know for me um i've had to learn quite a lot about it over the years um but i'd much rather you know have a good accountant standing beside me sort of and and you know hopefully showing me you know, what's working, what's not, and, and actually making me think about it. Yeah. Um, and certainly consultants I've worked with over the years um, have been very instrumental in lots of decisions I've made. So um, I think that is important. Yeah, interesting. And, of course, we can't have a conversation in the last three months without mentioning the coronavirus word. <laughs> so yeah. how, how has that affected your business? And um, I guess give us a little bit of insight on your plans forward everything's changed for so many people so how's it changed for you and and what are your yeah. plans well i um i was actually in dubai um because we are setting up over there um the week before so i got back from dubai on the 15th of march and um 
I mean, sort of before I'd gone, I checked out to buy, supposedly had nothing. Um, when we arrived, it was like a ghost town. And, you know, for anyone who's been to Dubai, it's usually absolutely rammed. Um, and Sheikh Said Road was, was free flowing. There was no one in the restaurants, no one in the malls. And when I spoke to the manufacturer, he said, but we have coronavirus here. Um, he said the schools were shut three weeks ago and they're shutting the parks and the public beaches on Sunday, which is when we were leaving. So um, that was a bit of an eye opener. Um, and I think we'd actually had the Taste of Kent Awards on the Thursday before I flew out on Friday. Um, and people were sort of starting to talk about it there. Um, but by the time I got back on the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, that following week, um, you know, it was all over the news that we were going to go into lockdown, that it was actually very serious. And um, that week our sales tanked. Um, all our customers um, mm -hmm. was like, we don't know if we can open or not. We just don't know what's going to happen. So we're not ordering. Um, so I sat down and did some very quick cash flows and worked out that, you know, we really couldn't afford to keep the staff on at their, their sort of current rates. Um, so in fairness, I sort of sat them all down and said, look, guys, you know, we either close um, and ride this storm and see what happens the other end, or I can maybe put you on 10 hours a week and just, you know, we, we work from week to week and see what happens. So... They actually all agreed to that, which was amazing. Um, and then the following Monday, they announced the furlough scheme. So actually, um, I said to them, look, you know, I can, based on what was coming in at the time, I can, I can carry on myself. Um, you guys go on furlough. That's your best position, you know, to keep your sort of wage coming in. And we'll see what happens. So um, subsequently, we um, about 70% of our customers closed down. Um, and it although a huge, huge I mean, we, number. we have been very aware of spreading our risk, um, and so we have about nine different sectors that we supply, um, but actually seven of those sectors are closed. You know, it's things like mm. cinemas, theatres, parlours, um, cafes, pubs, restaurants, cinemas. You know, the, the theatres and cinemas, I don't know when they're going to reopen. Um, so we, we were left with our retailers, independents, farm shops, that sort of thing. So... They were actually really busy, um, but obviously at 30% of what we usually yeah. do, um, we've, we've kept the staff off for the moment. I've got three coming back on the 6th of July, um, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I'm, I bet I'm you are. Exhausted. Yeah, so you've basically been thrown back to like year one. Yeah, it's. I mean, I was talking to someone else about this the other day, actually, it's, it is like we've gone back to year one, but we obviously... We have a lot more customers than we had in year one, and we have a lot more knowledge. So, mm. you know, the hope is that actually, you know, we will get through this faster than if we were in year one and, and sort of flailing about and trying to work yeah. out how we move. Um, I think, you know, for us, obviously the weather at the moment is amazing. Um, outlets are starting to open up now a little bit, um, but obviously they have much reduced footfall. So mm. that's going to impact on sales you know, throughout the summer. Um, and then coming into sort of September, October, when we rely on the food sector, food service sector, um, that's going to be interesting. Because, you know, if the theatres and cinemas and things aren't opening or, or come to a season isn't happening, you know, that is going to impact on our, our sort of earnings over the next six months. Yeah. Um, so we'll just have to see. I think, you know, for a lot of us, you know, the problem isn't necessarily going to be now. It's going to be in six months' time. Mm. Um so we'll just have to see. Yeah. But I think, you know, we are we are looking at cash flows daily and and sort of putting plans in place. Um, so hopefully we can ride the storm and come out the other side. Yes. Hopefully. I think everyone's kind of in the same boat, aren't they? We're all still Absolutely. very much up in the air. But um, just one more question, one more quick question for you. And it's mm -hmm. kind of the good ending of the interview for anyone that's thinking of starting a food business, especially right now. Uh, in the current economic climate, what's just give us you know one or two of your your biggest tips, things that you've learned along the way um, to help them on their journey. Um, I think probably the biggest tip would be um, to really do your research. You know, sort of if you have developed a product that you think will sell, um, you need to test it in the marketplace um, and do that before investing in packaging, um, investing money in any way really I mean sort of you know 
if you if you developed a product at home, take it out to farmers markets, take it out to malls, see if you can get a pitch, um, and just sample as many people as possible to get that consumer feedback before you take it to market um, and spend loads of money. Um, I think you know that would be my top tip because. Yeah. You know, as I said before, I think, you know, your friends and family are always going to be complimentary. Um, the great British public, not so much. So. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, it reminds me of like Britain's Got Talent or any of those where I'm sure everyone's parents tell them that they're <laughs> amazing. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, sort of, I think the other thing is, I mean, food is so subjective mm. and you have to actually grow quite a, a, a hard skin um, because not everyone is going to like your product even if it is amazing, yeah. um, you know, it's everyone's different taste. So mm. I think, you know, you do need to, to look at it from that point of view. I think, um, I think it's very easy to sort of, um, go into a trade show and see what the sort of, um, the trend is at, at the time and copy it, but actually, you know, try and find a USP, try and find something that is, is different. Mm. Um, and, and I think in this day and age, you need to look at the sustainability um, of your business, the environmental impact, the packaging, um, so that, you know, you're not just developing a good product, you're developing a whole company ethos that will stand you in good stead moving forward. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really Excellent. informative and lovely to hear from you. And um, wish you all the best in the coming months, week by week. Hope it goes well for you and um, hopefully things pick up in the summer. But um, thanks so thanks. much, Sally, and um, we'll speak to you later. Thank you very thanks. much.